Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Okay, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to another fine seminar. Uh, my name is Lauren Hayes. I'm a professor at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in the United States, and I'm the host of this week's seminar. Um, before I introduce our speaker for this week, I'd like to just quickly um, acknowledge, uh, make a couple of quick announcements. Um, share my screen. You can see I'm showing you here last week we had a really fascinating talk from Liz Lang about the Amberselli Baboon Project. Uh, if you want to catch up with that, um, her seminar, just like all other seminars, is recorded on YouTube. Um, next week we have uh, Thanksgiving break in the United States, so there will not be a, a fine seminar. We'll be returning the following week, uh, and that week we'll be hearing from uh, Simon Pica about animal cognition. Um, the fine seminar uh, team, the the co-hosts, have been putting together another seminar series for the spring, and probably sometime in late November, early December, we'll have an announcement about uh, the themes that we'll be hearing about uh, this coming spring in the northern hemisphere. Uh, just a quick, a couple of quick notes. Um, today's, you know, seminars, as always, we have the seminar goes about 45 minutes, after which we have time for questions. We go for about an hour. Um, I'll ask you to post your question marks in the chat. And uh, as always, we try to um, prioritize students and emerging scholars. So if you're a student or a postdoc, please, next to your question mark, put an S or a P, whatever you prefer. And those on YouTube, uh, someone will be monitoring that process. Please post your questions in the chat. Um, we also ask that during the actual presentation, limit or not put any chat messages. It might be a distraction to the speaker. Um, so please uh, just wait until the question part of it after the seminar is over. And as always, please tell us who you are when you engage in conversation. We want to continue to build a community. So please tell us your name, where you're from, and you know, your, your, your research interests. With that, uh, I'm really happy to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Janet Mann will be presenting to us on her research. Um, Janet, Dr. Mann is a, a, a member of the Department of Biology at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Uh, she's a distinguished university professor with appointments in departments of biology and psychology. Uh, Janet has uh, did her undergraduate at Brown University in Rhode Island and then a master's and PhD at the University of Michigan. And since then, her research has been quite prolific. Um, her work is focused on bottlenose dolphins, primarily in the Shark Bay area in Australia. Um, and it's addressed a diversity of questions regarding social animals. Um, she's looked at social networks, female reproduction, calf development, life history, tool use, social learning, and has even done some uh, work on conservation issues related to these dolphins. So quite a prolific research program. Um, her project, as she talks, tracks thousands of dolphins, and I'll, I won't give any more details because I imagine she'll tell you today. Um, and her work has been quite prolific uh, publication-wise, well over 100 publications in good journals, um, anything from Nature Communications, Proceeding National Academy, World's- Oh, Society. come on. And I could go continue with many excellent publications during her career. Um, she's also been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And as she was talking ahead at the talk, at the front of the talk, her research has been well-funded for quite some time, primarily by the National Science Foundation, uh, from multiple units in the National Science Foundation. And, and I know for I know she also has supported a lot of student research through this uh, funding mechanism through the international program at NSF. I imagine you'll be hearing about some of her students' work there. She's also been engaged in teaching. Uh, she teaches in both biology and psychology and offers a diversity of courses from topical things like animal, animal behavior to anything uh, specific courses on the biology of marine mammals. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Janet. And thank you, Janet, for being here with us today. And I, I look forward to hearing about your work. 
Well, thank you for inviting me. This is a really great opportunity uh, to talk to so many wonderful colleagues around the world, and I'm very excited about it. And uh, so why don't I just, uh, and some of my uh, former students are here, like Ev uh, Krzysztof, I see, and some um, others I'm sure that I haven't seen on the on the list, but I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, okay, can everybody see that okay? Um, yes, it looks great. Okay, I'm just going to hide those meeting controls that get in the way. Okay, uh, so as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about social bonds, um, reproduction and survival in wild bottlenose dolphins. And my two co-authors are currently postdocs with me, Molly McKenty and McEntee, and um, Vivian Frugerard. Um, and Vivian will start as an assistant professor at Texas A&M in January. Um, and um, Ev Kristjak, who's uh, actually here also, um, and has this photo. I, Ev, I haven't credited all your photos in this talk, but um, you'll you'll recognize some of them. Um, and uh, she's currently at University of Bangor. Okay, so, um, uh, just... so I also want to start by crediting my mentors. Even though I was at Brown, uh, Jean Altman was one of my mentors when I was an undergraduate, and I started out in primatology um, as a research assistant, uh, and that was. Um, a really formative experience for me. And much of what we do on the Shark Bay project is sort of modeled after uh, the Amboseli Baboon project in terms of uh, how you create a database and, and track animals for uh, decades. And when I was in graduate school, um, Barbara Smuts was my advisor mentor. And she was the one who introduced me to the dolphins because she wanted to start a project out there. Um, and then she decided to go back to studying um, not primates, but dogs <laughs> and domestic dogs. And I uh, stayed out in Shark Bay and continued uh, the research. Uh, I also want to acknowledge many of the logistical um, supporters of our work and uh, colleagues that I uh, work with at a range of universities um, and organizations that help us keep our facilities out there uh, in Shark Bay, and particularly the NSF, which, as uh, Lauren mentioned, has supported my work for uh, many years. Um, and as anyone knows with long-term projects, that there are can be literally hundreds of students and uh, colleagues that we've worked with uh, some of the, the big names, uh, the ones that are highlighted are ones that really work with me um, for a long time uh, as graduate students and so on. Um, but there are many, many people who have contributed to this work in a variety of ways. So I think there's, I don't know, 250 names on this list. So let me take you to Western Australia, which is a pretty remote uh, place. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is where in the 1980s, um, the Shark Bay Research Project began. Um, I'm getting some noise. I don't know if some people have are on mute, but I can hear I'm other just, people. Uh, it is OK. There's a little bit of, of like friction, but it, I hear you fine. OK, OK. I could just hear some people in the background. OK, um, that's fine, as long as everyone can hear me OK. Um, so uh, we worked a place, uh, Shark Bay is about um, uh, uh, 650 kilometers north of Perth. And our study area, uh, which is shown here, is um, off the Perrin Peninsula. It's about 600 uh, square kilometers. And we study Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins. Um, just to orient you a little to what the habitat looks like, because I'll refer back to this, but um, it has diverse habitats. This is what we refer to as like deep open, has a silty bottom. And then there are these uh, channels which have high current and a rocky substrate, um, lots of seagrass beds, um, 
and also uh, sand flats. Those are some of the major habitats that we work in. And the water is shallow and clear, so we can see what the dolphins are doing. So the way I've organized this is to give you some background and methods and then um, talk about the sex-specific challenges of a dolphin's life uh, from birth to uh, to late adulthood and with some uh, conclusions. And the challenges I'm going to focus on are the social and ecological uh, challenges that they experience. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, we've been doing long-term and longitudinal study of individuals uh, since from 1984 to the present, and about 1,800 individuals have been tracked. Um, in any given year, we usually see about 500 to 600 um, individuals uh, that are sort of currently, you know, we get a lot of detail on and, and most they're residential population. So we see them um, multiple times a year, every, every year. I'm going to talk a little bit about methods. It's all from small boats. We don't swim with the animals. We survey groups. So kind of taking a snapshot of who's there and what they're doing and um, ecological and behavioral information, but also physiological, any wounds or um, pregnancies or um, uh, other details that we can note physically about the animals. Um, and we use photo ID. We don't tag them. Uh, we uh, This is an example of our sort of what we call our fin sheets that we actually have in the boat, but we take um, photos and we match them up to a catalog later on. Um, but this is uh, six females as an example. And um, uh, in our, like, we have the year of birth or approximate if we, we don't know exactly um, the um, their sex. And then uh, for just to help us, like the last year they were seen. So what to pay attention for out, out in the water. And then the X just means we've also um, had gotten genetic data. So we biopsied them. Uh, so we know relatedness and paternities for um, a, a fair number of animals uh, for a population like this. And then, of course, their their names <laughs> and codes. Um, we also do focal follow work uh, as that we follow individuals for long periods of time. Uh, typically now it's an, uh, an hour on a focal follow but we used to do sometimes all day follows on individuals. And because these animals have not been uh, harassed or had any problems with humans, they're very tolerant of our boats. And a lot of times we can just kill the motor and just sit there and watch them for long periods of time because they are residential and they're not just you know on the move all the time. Uh, we also do genetic sampling. Um, so that's kind of the only really invasive thing that we do. Um, uh, using a biopsy system, but this is Shark Bay and the animals are pretty scarred up, so they don't react very strongly to the um, biopsy and no no animals have been uh, injured this way. Um, dolphins live in a fission fusion society uh, or it's characterized by fission fusion. Uh, and that means the groups are basically not, they can change flexibly uh, from moment to moment. And in fact, they change their group composition on average uh, six times an hour. Sometimes it could be more frequent. Sometimes they can stay with the same individual all day. Uh, but it's always um, changing. We use a 10-meter chain rule. So whoever's within 10 meters of anyone else in the group is how we define the group. Um, and the uh, so you, we wouldn't say they're in a stable pod. People say, oh, a pod of dolphins. But we don't call it a pod because you we think of that as stable, well, more stable, like with killer whales or pilot whales. Um, their average group size around four to five animals. Um, and as you probably know from Richard Connor and Michael Crutzen's work, the males form these multi-level alliances. And uh, the females, however, have kind of a looser, largely kin-based network structure, but they have uh, associations with kin and non-kin, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and females are much more variable than the males in terms of their social bonds. Um, females have their first calf typically at 11 or 12 years. The average is actually 13. 
Um, but any pregnancy before age 10 is, but there's only one female who uh, uh, was pregnant before age 10. And their maximum lifespan is in their early 50s. So that gives you a sense. Um, just to describe a little bit about the male alliance structure, um, males form these long-term bonds of pairs and uh, triplets uh, primarily, but they also form secondary uh, relationships with other alliances. So in this example, <clears throat> A might be also uh, have a, a second order relationship with alliance C and B and D might would have a second order uh, relationship with each other. So these alliances uh, primarily function to compete with other males uh, for access to a single female that they form a consortship with. Um, and the, the males will also um, harass and intimidate the females because it's they're the same body size as the females, uh, but two or three males against one uh, can be sort of difficult. So to illustrate, in this case, um, Alliance A is with the female and they're in formation behind her, which is typical in alliances. And they may get challenged by Alliance B, which comes in and challenges A. And because it's three against two, a might lose the female to B, um, but then A goes and recruits Alliance C to come and help uh, get the female back for Alliance A. And then Alliance B uh, might recruit their buddy Alliance D to come and challenge. And then in the middle of all of this with uh, uh, 11 males uh, all uh, fighting with each other, the female takes off in the middle and they don't even notice. So what are the significant challenges during development? And I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the young of the year and particularly the newborn period, uh, the calf period, which is up to they get weaned at a, on average age four, uh, but anywhere from about uh, two and a half uh, to nine years of age. Um, the juvenile period is typically uh, from four to 10, uh, 10 years of age, and we consider a young adult 10 to uh, 20 approximately, or 10 to 25, um, and then older adult. So first, I mean, fundamentally, I'm going to talk about mortality because uh, to understand the challenges, you have to understand well what causes, um, what what happens to them um, during the, these different stages of life. So, uh, and my graduate student, who's now postdoc, Molly McEntee, um, has published this work in uh, Proc B. The um, highest mortality uh, is in the first year of life, not surprisingly, it's about 23%, uh, about uh, another 10%, um, or it's 33% by age three, and then 41% by age 10. So some animals do disappear um, in the uh, juvenile period. Um, one of the, the, the primary challenges, um, and I have a little sound clip for that, um, for the newborn period right after birth. Um, <laughs> for any of you like the BGs, but they, um, the big challenge is that they have to breathe. Breathing is conscious. And so for a marine mammal, like to stay with the mother and breathe and not get eaten by tiger sharks is significant. Um, and we have some current work that we haven't, published yet, but it's in preparation, but at least half of the um, sources of mortality that we can identify, it's usually either um, poor, you know, poor condition um, of the mother and or the calf uh, or a uh, tiger shark, because they do have lots of, um, there are big tiger sharks there. And um, sometimes we see the animals uh, or the mother has severe shark bite scars and the calf is gone. Um, so those are kind of the major sources of mortality, at least that we know about, but often it's just that the, the calf disappears. In the calf period, um, the, the calf has to learn how to coordinate with the mother, um, uh, and there are changes in her activity and her diving. Um, they do swim close with her and get a benefit uh, from the hydrodynamic boost, but when she's foraging, um, uh, she has to get enough to eat to support the calf, and the calf also has to learn everything 
that she does. Um, in addition to joining and leaving, because it is a pigeon fusion society and the calves do go off and even join other groups without the mother and then come back. Um, so they have to coordinate uh, acoustically and um, with all the changes in behavior and all the individuals. They have to learn, obviously, how to catch fish and uh, hunting is uh, difficult and catching fish is difficult. Um, every fish has ant different anti-predation tactics. And so they have to overcome them and they usually learn a particular a uh, range of foraging tacks from the mother by watching the mother and seeing also, you know, what she eats. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. They have to learn how to catch the right kind of fish. There are toxic fish, um, spiny fish, um, and some of them are very difficult to process. So it's not just you swim around and get a fish. Um, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and of course, they have to learn the network. And uh, for these animals, they have to learn um, hundreds of individuals and also the relationships between um, because when they're weaned they're going to be on their own um, they can check in with mom every once in a while especially daughters but uh, basically they're they stay in the same area they're bisexually philopatric but they have to learn everything before um, before weaning uh, to survive so we don't really know sex differences during uh, in mortality during the calf period. And that's partly because we don't actually, um, we haven't found one for ones that we know the sexes of before they're weaned. But this is because since most of the calves die in the first year, it's usually they died before we were able to sex them. So that's showing you the green line. So, um, so we haven't seen any sex differences. There could be sex differences in um, uh, calf mortality, but we haven't been able to detect it because they die before being sexed. Um, but there is higher uh, juvenile male mortality than female um, in the, in, well, in the juvenile period. Uh, and we think that this uh, is related to uh, their social um, position and uh, dynamics. 12.8% uh, uh, mortality rate in just in like just the juvenile period. And some of the um, what's important is that they um, can develop all of these social skills so that then when they're on their own, they're not being supported by the mother, um, that they can survive. So for females, it's uh, developing foraging skills in particular. And for males, um, especially given the importance of alliances, developing um, bonds, and they spend a lot of more time focused on that. Um, and so uh, in the uh, juvenile period, the, here's an example of like several juvenile males harassing another one. They also pet and rub each other, and there's all, all kinds of social contact. But we know that um, from one of my previous grad students, um, Maggie Stanton, um, that Juvenile males that had um, uh, sort of low eigenvector centrality, like just, you know, prior to weaning, um, were had lower probability of survival than, um, than uh, males that had high eigenvector centrality, suggesting that that um, social position that they have is uh, important for surviving um, the juvenile period, whereas in females, it was uh, not related. So uh, females didn't matter what their social position was um, pre-weaning to post-weaning. And in fact, females just really rarely die during the juvenile period. Um, to give you an example of the uh, network dynamics, and um, I'm just going to play a little, this is a male in the first and I just have the top 15 associates, but just so you could see, um, it starts out, this is a male, Cookie, and his mother, um, Crooked Finn, in uh, pink. And then there are some other um, mother-calf pairs here that these are mother-son pairs specifically that they associate with. And you could see how these same, over time, when I play this, you'll see how um, some of those bonds strengthen, particularly like uh, with Smokey, Jesse, uh, Rabble, and then 
another one isn't born yet, but comes into the picture. Um, so what you're seeing is uh, the the ties uh, between uh, these individuals. Um, and uh, now we're sort of in the juvenile period. Uh, now we're in the uh, late juvenile period. And are, now we're into adulthood. And you could see Cookie has really strengthened his ties with other males in particular, um, and even some of his childhood friends. There's um, uh, two of his childhood friends there, Smokey and um, Urchin, uh, when he gets uh, well into adulthood. And in contrast um, with the females, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, Peglet and her mother, Squarelet, and her sister, her older sister, um, sorry, their mother, Square, and her older sister, Squarelet, uh, squarelet. And um, similarly, like playing through time, how <clears throat> her associations have changed. Let me watch it while I get some water. And she still has some ties with some of her childhood uh, male buddies, but it's uh, much weaker. And you can see um, her ties are a little more diffuse. Um, she has maintained a tie um, with her um her one of her sisters died and the, another sister shown up but at the end um she's got somewhat weaker associations except the one with her um this is her younger sister um and some of these other females so that's just to give you a sense of how their networks change during development um also they have a diverse set of foraging tactics, and this is very important for the females. Uh, they develop these um, um, during the calf period, typically, and they learn them from their mothers. Um, don't really have time to go into all of them. Um, this is female who hunts giant fish, and her daughter also hunts these giant trevally. Um, another female that beaches to uh, catch primarily mullet um, on uh, some of the sandy beaches. And uh, shelling is a, another behavior where they chase fish out of uh, baler and uh, giant uh, snail shells, and they hold them out of the water to drain the water out, we think. Um, and sponging, which is the most famous because it's a form of tool use, I'm going to come back to that, um, where they use basket marine sponges to ferret uh, prey out of the seafloor. Um, one of my graduate students um, was very interested in the kind of socio-ecological phenotypes. So both the social dynamics, because as I've said, they vary. Some of the females can be fairly solitary up to very social. Um, the males generally are much more social. Um, and uh, sh she's looked at the repeatability of um, these individual phenotypes from calf to adulthood, and they are um, somewhat stable uh, over decades. So, and the, for females, they kind of fall into these six clusters. For males, it's more like three clusters. Like so, so for the females, some of them are in large groups in deep open water, typically, um, and do different foraging types. Then, uh, in contrast, like the spongers, which are actually um, where are the spongers here? Um, here in the um, uh, the purple are the uh, spongers who tend to be fairly solitary and uh, solitary tool users. And um, for the males, they can be um, in small groups or large groups and tend to be in shallow water or in deep water. Um, so um, I can, I'll talk about some of these issues um, further on. And the females <clears throat> show higher stability, <clears throat> excuse me, generally. And that's because if you're um, if you're a um, a male and you're born to a solitary sponger, you have to become get alliance partners and be social. Whereas if you're a daughter born to a um, sponger, you just sponge like you become like her. So we see higher stability <clears throat> in females than in males over time. And it's just to show you the diversity of sponges uh, that they use as their tools. They use um, primarily one species, um, uh, but they're 
they uh, use different uh, sponges and they use their tool for like about an hour. Um, the spongers, this is what the basket sponges look like uh, in the, and it's in these deep channels. This is look, what it looks like when they wear them. This is what the channels look like that they use them. It's very rocky substrate. And this is just pointing out how well hidden the fish are that they're uh, going after uh, with the sponges. And we have that from but DNA from their poop, what uh, the primary species are, and some photos of what they've seen, and from sponging ourselves. And I had a student, uh, Eric Patterson, which is in the last slide, who did all these dive transects to uh, see what was in those channels and um, uh, sort of the deep open that I mentioned earlier, and then these channels where they is, which is where they sponge. And just to show you, so here's the fish on the bottom that they scare up, and this is what it looks like in the channels when we take a sponge on the end of a pole, and you're going to see one of the um, you're going to see one of the fish that they scare up um, using uh, the sponge tool. And there it is. It's kind of hard to see, but there's the um, it's barred sand perch, and that's what they're going after. And um, the only thing you scare up with a sponge in um, the deep open habitat is silk and uh, a poisonous goby was going to come out and that you can't eat anyway but we really didn't find there was really nothing you get out of sponging in the silty area uh, but you get a lot of these uh, barred sandwich which, which are good eating if you do it in there i'm going to return to the spongers in uh, a bit because there's a more of an interesting story there um so, yeah is there a question? Sorry. Oh, I'll just keep going then. In early adulthood, um, the costs of reproduction um, are what really seem to affect particularly the uh, females. And um, I mentioned that in the juvenile period, males have higher mortality. Well, it switches when you get to early adulthood um, because females now have um, a slightly higher mortality. And that's because of the when they start reproduction, they have quite a few costs, not just in rearing the calves, but also um, the harassment from uh, males, which I'll talk about uh, in a bit. Um, they don't have a difference in the median lifespan. It's, it's you know, um, so if you just look at the median lifespan or the expected lifespan, it's not different, but it is, they do have uh, shifts in um, the threats uh, to survival, uh, depending on your sex, through their lifespan. Um, so I'm going to turn to this um, in a little more detail. Um, but just to show you, 21% of the females actually had no calving success. So um, this is like the number of surviving calves uh, that are per female reproductive year. Um, and this, I think, is a quite a big number. Um, but you know, and this roughly normally distributed after this big bump at the, at zero. So put another way, like um, females on average, like successfully calve every uh, 10 years. Um, but we, but this, we're very interested in the 21% that don't calve. I should mention some of those females die. So they have zero um, because again, uh, mortality increases um, in early adulthood. So some of those females are zeros because they died before they could successfully raise a calf. 17% um, of the females who live to past 25, though, never successfully raise a calf. So if you don't reproduce early, you're just not going to reproduce. I mean, so they have to um, successfully calf before age 25. Um, they do have reproductive senescence, not menopause. Um, this is another one of my grad students. Um, and, you know, with age, there's increased calf mortality, but they also uh, have later weaning. So uh, they have what's called terminal investment. Um, and so the late weaners, the ones who are nursing six, seven, eight years um, are to the old females. Um, so they have long interbirth intervals. So, but they also have higher mortality as, um, with age. Um, just to uh, explain how reproduction works, you have um, the female cycling for like three to six months. She's in front of a, a allied males here. Um, and then she might, uh, she gets pregnant and gestation is, uh, 
about one year. And then early lactation, which uh, is uh, fairly costly. And then um, sort of late lactation, which can last, as I said, anywhere up to um, eight years. And then she might cycle again. And sort of that's the sort of, um, she usually gets pregnant in the last year of lactation and weans the calf midway um, through her pregnancy. Um, so these costs, um, how do these costs affect uh, uh uh, reproduction and what's the um, effect on female fitness and mortality risk. Um, so Molly has done a lot of work on this and um, we looked at the successful and unsuccessful females and how often they are seen with adult males. And early on, there isn't a big, you know, sort of um, there isn't a big difference when the female's young and the ones that become successful versus unsuccessful at raising calves um, and in fact, when they're unsuccessful because they keep losing calves, they're with males frequently because they lost a calf, they get pregnant again, they lose a calf, they get pregnant again. Um, so they're seen with males often, um, even in this in this early period. But the males seem to know they're, that these females are they're just not going to get uh, be successful with age, and we hardly ever we just don't see them with males if they live a long life, they're not going to be seen with males as when they get old. But the successful females, the, ma the, the males are much more likely uh, to be seen with with age. So the, the males can clearly tell which females are uh, successful over time or not. Um, just to show you that uh, the females who are unsuccessful do have higher mortality. We don't know if this is because they're in poor condition um, or because uh, they experience so much harassment to begin with, or if they lose their first calf, they get into a negative cycle of then getting pregnant and having the calf out of season. I should have mentioned they have seasonal births. Um, so females who are unsuccessful are actually more likely to die earlier than the reproductively successful female. Um, so whatever the cause, it suggests that the females who are um, reproductively successful are probably in better condition than the unsuccessful females. Um, but um, for ones that we've seen who have had a birth um, versus um, no births, um, if you just look at the um, unsuccessful females, um, the females who we never saw with a birth actually lived a long time. And the females who had at least one birth but lost their calf died. So it suggests um, died earlier. So it suggests that um, to us that at least females who have experienced some of the costs of reproduction of having a calf um, and investing in that calf, um, that it might be more costly than the females who either their calves die right away or we're not, so we didn't see them um, or, um, you know, have just experienced perhaps less male harassment Um as a consequence, we don't really know, but it's an interesting um, pattern. So these again are the unsuccessful females. Um, so to sort of modify this, the you know the females that are not successful, you know they have a pregnancy, but then they start they lose the calf perhaps prenatally, and we never see it or right away, and they start cycling again, or females that have invested in the calf and then start cycling lose the calf and start cycling again, and then get in this kind of negative uh, trajectory of cycling, male harassment. Um, and the males, I should say, take them often out of their preferred foraging areas and away from their social uh, network. So there are costs to the females. To turn a little bit to um, some of the other work by um, Vivian Frugerard, um, who's looked a lot at kinship, um, and uh, and bonds between the females. And we uh, here I'm talking about primarily association because in the fission fusion society, association is a good marker of their relationship. Um, these are uh, associates also like pet and rub each other more akin to grooming. And um, uh, so association is a good measure. The um, adult females preferentially affiliate with maternal kin, but they, uh, but they also interestingly associate with paternally related kin. Um, but, and, and they have 
uh, bonds with unrelated females. Um, and the size of the number of kin available doesn't determine how many non-kin female bonds that they have. Um, so it is much more complex in that sense. You know, as I mentioned, it's much more variable, but also we still understand um, not enough about what is driving female bonds. Um, uh, so as I've mentioned, a few things that are related to um, uh, calving success, clearly it's related to age. Younger females are much more, are more successful than older females, but we have not found it being related to their foraging ecology um, in terms of their calving success. But we have some recent data to suggest that the spongers, um, back to the spongers, are living longer than the other females in the population. And this is just showing you a survival curve uh, where the kind of orange line is the spongers and the um, bluish green line is the non-spongers. Um, so we know that they're living longer. We're not sure why. They have a better diet or whatever it is. But I should... I'm going to hark back to that the spongers are amongst the most solitary females in our sample. So you wouldn't expect to find social bonds um, necessarily driving uh, survival when our most solitary females are actually the ones who are living the longest. But again, you know, in terms of calving success, you know, age uh, seems to be one of the uh, main drivers of that. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the um, impacts of the male alliances on, on females uh, and show you just what it looks like from a drone um, point of view. This is Molly, and this is uh, one of our boats. But here you can see this is a female. Um, it's going to pause periodically because it's a big file, but a female with her calf swimming under her nursing calf who's ready to be weaned three and a half. And here's one alliance that is with that female. There is actually another alliance here, a trio, and then another um, also with a female. So you get can have several alliances um, uh, together. And um, you could see how the males uh, move together. Or is that? It'll, it'll move. It's just uh, slow when I play it this way. Stalling. Hmm. Sorry, I, I'll try like jumping ahead, see if I can get it to, there it goes. Uh, you can see some socializing actually, what you missed was one of the males came over to um, pet with uh, one of the males from the other alliances. You can have friendly relations. Um, I'm not able to show you everything that's going on here. Oh, well, um, I'm just going to move on, unfortunately. But um, I can try to play it again at the end uh, to show you some of those dynamics. Um, that? Okay. Um, we've also looked at... Um, we, we are interested in how social bonds relate to survival for both sexes. Um, and it's notable, as I've said, dolphins vary widely in their gregariousness and bonds. Uh, so that enables us to um, have kind of a natural experiment that way. But one of the things that we're very interested in is um, if individual differentiated social bonds are important, um, but it varies widely between individuals, then it might be the change in bonds, which has survival consequences, not the absolute number of bonds, um, nor their strength. So in other words, you might be, have a fairly, um, be very gre gregarious or not. Um, but if that changes during your lifetime, um, that might be, um, detrimental to your, uh, that might be stressful or um, detrimental to your uh, welfare. And so we looked at that, this in two ways, using both a kind of inferential and a predictivist approach. Um, and I had a, a postdoc, Rob Rankin, who did this using um, time intervals for the, the sort of long-term network dynamics at two-year intervals. 
to see whether we could predict whether a dolphin lives or dies based on changes in their um, network. And um, to summarize like those results, um, we did find closeness centrality, like a change in closeness centrality um, did, no matter which approach you used, it kept coming up as uh, um, predicting um, survival. And even, you know, at any age, like if you changed in, um, if you had a shift in the closeness centrality in your network, then you were uh, more likely to die in the uh, subsequent time interval. Um, and we also looked at a widowhood effect, like with your top associate. And um, as you might expect, this was not important for the males. This is just showing you uh, log odds of dying uh, on a widow effect on the um, x-axis and age on the y-axis. And you could see there's a lot more uh, points for the males in terms of, um, you know, deaths. And with females, it was just unimportant. So we did find also a widow effect. And if, for those of you who are unfamiliar, in humans, this has been found, you know, when one partner dies, um, the other is more likely to uh, die soon after. Um, and uh, that's interesting, given the relative importance of social bonds um, between the males. Um, but I should say, like for males, um, we know that um, they're from a couple of papers, one by uh, Gerber et al., um, that their bonds, particularly the relations, this is showing you the number of paternities uh, related to the uh, node strength that males had with a secondary alliance. So their sort of alliance of alliance um, strength uh, was related to their uh, the number of paternities they had. But we have also found um, that the age of cons is a really important predictor of um, male reproductive success. In other words, um, for the paternities, this is the green line. Um, males tend to get more successful as they reach their uh, uh, early 30s. Um, and for females, it's the opposite. You know, it's they have very, the, the purple line is that they have successful early reproduction. Um, okay. Um, and then finally, um, uh, being conscious of the time, I wanted to mention um, that even though it's a pristine uh, site, it's not uh, it, it's not immune to the uh, vagaries of climate change. And we had an extreme uh, marine heat wave, the most extreme on record in 2011, um, and this destroyed 80 percent of the dominant seagrass in Shark Bay, which is known, which is one of the largest seagrass habitats in the world, and it was the biggest seagrass die-off that has been documented. Um, and this caused a change, obviously, in the fish populations, and we're looking at the uh, survival cost. So this is uh, before 2011, and you could see the green, um, healthy seagrass beds, uh, uh, just as an example. Hopefully you can see that. And then in contrast, um, what happened after the heat wave, and you could see there's just tiny little uh, patches uh, left here. Um, so we are looking at the long-term changes in like from behavior to survival um, as an impact um, in the heat wave. Um, and uh, so far, <clears throat> it looks like the spongers have done pretty well, but so did um, those that didn't have any, um, that just don't use the seagrass beds very much. Um, but the ones that specialize in the seagrass um, um, had very low uh, calf survival. So the calves born to females that um, forage primarily in seagrass had much higher mortality um, following the heat wave compared to um, compared to other females. So it depends on what kind of special um, uh, specialization, foraging specialization that you have. Um, so with that, hopefully you've gotten um, a bit about how the importance of social bonds and uh, reproduction, uh, the, the importance of social bonds uh, to reproduction um, and survival and other factors like their uh, foraging e ecology. And uh, with that, I will uh, 
I'm very anxious to hear your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. Uh, it's really fun to hear about that system. It was a fascinating talk. Um, I appreciate all the work you put into it. Um, uh, yeah. Now I have to get back to, I can't find my um, controls to stop sharing the screen. <laughs> Come on back. Um, I'm always how do I get? I think yeah. You to no. share, go down to um, share screen and it's not show, it's not coming up oh. yeah sorry uh i think i have to open this uh well, you can see everybody here i can't get to the uh controls for some reason come on um uh, i just have you can see all each other on my screen because I'm sharing screen, right? But we can see the panel on the right. But um, let me see if I can. If you remove, if you don't, if you remove her co-host for a second. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm not Sorry, sharing screen anymore. Just... Oh, there it goes. It's back. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So. Here we're going to have the question session, question and answer session discussion. Um, just a reminder, um, you know, when you when I call on you, please uh, state your name, where you're from, what you're doing, just so we can continue to build um, a community here. I will prioritize uh, students over some more senior folks to get them involved. And for those of you on YouTube, please post your question. And um, Eduardo or Carson. Are you able to watch that a bit? Help me out here. Eduardo, are you able to watch YouTube? I'm opening now. Yeah, I want to. Thank you. Go I, I have not. I have not on it. Okay, thank you. So those on YouTube, someone will forward your question to me. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I will. Um, I see a lot of questions already, Janet. So here we go. I'm going to start with a student question. Um, and I, I'm going to get this wrong. Is it y'all, Rosengarten? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for the lecture. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, do you want me to introduce myself or just go please, to the question? Yes, please tell who you are, where you're from, and what you're interested in very briefly. I am a student in Bar Ilan University in Israel. Um, I'm working on, well, I'm working on, and I'm starting my master's in ecology. Great. Um, my question was regarding, you spoke about the social network of mm -hmm. bottlenose nose dolphins. Um, my question was, uh, did you, uh, sorry. Uh, which interactions did you use to measure the centra uh, to construct the social network? Did you discriminate certain interactions, or did you use any interaction you uh, you recorded? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, a great question. We use association indices, usually the half weight association. Although sometimes we use simple ratio. It turns out it doesn't really matter which one uh, we use, but we uh, always uh, make sure we have at least um, 15 uh, sightings, typically, of an individual um, in the time period that we're using. <clears throat> so we have to have 15 sightings of each individual uh, uh, to get, uh, because we've looked at um, whether that's enough to represent their associations. And then we um, usually uh, subsample those if we have a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, for some animals we might have more than a thousand sightings and for some we might have 20. Um, so we will uh, sort of do a, a random sort of a subsampling so that we have uh, comparable sample sizes. I should say we've also compared um, 
association with direct interactions um, and uh, they are basically the same, you know, so individuals who spend more time together also have um, more uh, affiliative interactions with each other. Does that answer your question? So we use weighted networks. We're always using weighted networks. Uh, it does. Thank you very much. All right. So our uh, next question goes to Jonathan Pertil. Pertil. Uh, but thank you. Um, thanks for the, the great talk. Um, I'm Jonathan. I'm a first year grad student in anthropology at Yale. Uh, I study owl monkeys. Um, so when the, uh, you had the seagrass die off, um, did you notice a change in the relative like survival, uh, uh, the calf survival between the older females and the younger females? I basically did the older females have better calf survival than you would expect normally in that situation. That's a great question. We haven't, um, we haven't looked at that yet. We, um, it took several years for the calf survival to show up. So we did notice behavioral changes. Um, and uh, so it, it took a few years before we noticed an effect. And I think what happened was that the fish that were left in the seagrass were easier to catch because it was less dense. Um, so in the beginning, it actually looks like they took advantage of the less dense seagrass because they spent more time in the remaining seagrass um, and others moved into the seagrass. Oh. But the age thing, if you know, it's a great question because you think like the older females would have more experience or know what to do um, maybe than the younger. Um, but it's a good idea. We'll we'll try to look at that. We're still, um, you know, when the, when, yeah, it's a great question. The older females might um, like prioritize their caste survival even more than their own survival. Like if they're like facing like a challenge, like that's going to challenge their own survival as well, I guess. We think that, yeah, we think that they might actually, um, you know, like what the older females do is keep the the later ones on for longer. So they do in a sense, um, I guess one strategy would be to wean them, wean them off uh, so you can survive or keep them on so they can survive. I suspect the older females would actually invest more and uh, keep them on for longer. But we haven't looked at that, the weaning ages, uh, since the die off. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have one more question uh, from a student, then I'll jump back into the queue. So uh, it goes to Jingyu. Uh, hello, I'm Jingyu. I'm a PhD student from the University, University of Strasbourg working on the personality of both crew rats. So uh, first of all, an interesting talk. And my question is about the foraging behavior, foraging strategies of, of the females. So you said they have different type of strategies like the spongers and the uh, with sea grasses. So my question is like for example when one of the when your strategy becomes less efficient, does the female tend to switch to other strategies or do they just keep their keep the old one and just try harder? Um yeah well the um I mean, that's another good question. Um, we find really high stability in the females foraging um, behavior. You know, like the sponger sponge forever. We've had, uh, you know, one of the females is 52 years old now and she's been sponging at least since 1984, the beginning of the project. Um, uh, so we haven't seen really dramatic switches of any of the females. Um, we know... Our initial data after the like the seagrass die off was that the seagrass foragers like doubled down and spent more time in the seagrass, um, even though it was. And we're we're still trying to figure that out. Was it initially more successful because the fish had fewer places to hide, or 
um, and then it caught up with them. So we're, we we think it might have changed over time. We are noticing there's been some recovery, although the seagrass composition is now different, more tropical species. Um, and we are noticing some differences, but I'm I'm we haven't looked at the data yet, like as to whether there's, the, you know, the question is like, should go to show plasticity or are they going to, you know, canalize and and keep doing what they're doing? Um, and we're we're still going to trying to figure that out. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Ask me back in five years or if we get the funding to keep to look at it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so our next question is from Zulema. Hi, Zulema Tang Martinez, uh, retired from the University of Missouri in St. Louis. And um, Lauren, I'm sorry, I sent two questions. I sent the first one to you accidentally, and then I sent it to everyone. Um, thank you very much for a uh, really fascinating talk about dolphins. And I have um, several questions, but before I get to those, since this is my only opportunity and I have the mic, I just want to say hello to Erica Milam and say how <laughs> wonderful it is to see you <laughs> after so many, so much time, so many years. So going on to my questions, um, you mentioned that females, uh, if I understood you correctly, approximately 17% of the females never reproduce successfully. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually a little higher. Um, okay. There, but it's a, it's about twenty percent. I, I guess you know. But it it that was sort of a subsample I took for like the ones that survived to older than twenty. Uh, you know that that survived after. Um, you know. Longer, but yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's still about it's about a fifth of the females. Yeah, yeah, which is a lot. So my, um, I have two questions, but this is the main part. So with regards to that, do you have any measures for what percentage of the males reproduce successfully versus do not reproduce successfully? Or are you even able to get that data in your system? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Yeah, another great question. Um, uh, you know, we know it's really skewed. Um, so there's a lot of males that have, we have never, we have not documented a paternity. Um, so it's definitely skewed. Um, and it's, uh, we don't know if, um, yeah, so we do have a lot of males that have zeros. I don't know the exact number. Um, you know, we, we know about 80 paternities, um, and I should say not all of them are ne necessarily in alliances. We have some like super successful males, but, um, beyond that, I can't tell you how many are, are, we're, we're like really confident have gotten nowhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but it sounds like like you think that the skew in males is greater than in females. Yes, I think the skew is greater. Um, but uh, but certainly there's a, a lot more variation in, in female reproduction than most people think about. Um, you know, they always assume it's going to be, you know, a pretty normal distribution. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then the, the last question uh, is just a matter of my not completely understanding what you said. In the, in the shelling behavior, mm -hmm. it wasn't clear to me what the dolphins are doing with the shells. Do the, do the prey live in the shells and they shake out the prey or is there something more involved? Yeah, they're using empty, you know, shells so that the mollusk has died within um, and I think the, the fish are just hiding in the shells okay. and they actually, um, and it could be that the dolphin is chasing the fish and sees it go into the shell, or it could be that they don't see, we don't really know, um, or they, it could be that, oh, there's a, a, a shell, there's probably a fish hiding in it, and then they just pick it up with their beak and they pick it out of the water, so the water drains out and the fish has to 
come out too. Um, so, but they get really gigantic um, shells sometimes. They're very heavy. Oh. Um, so, yeah, um, it's an opportunistic, it's very quick behavior. Um, it's, it's usually only a few seconds. Uh, and, and are there females that only do that? Or is that just one, you know, like for, for a given female, will a given female have a different um, foraging strategy? But if they happen to run into a shell, they'll pick it up and shake, try to shake out the prey. Or are there females that specialize in shelling? Yeah, well, this is, um, so this has been studied like in the Western Gulf, which is an, um, so there are other people have sort of looked at it more than we have shelling in like both the Eastern Gulf where I work and the Western Gulf. Um, we have repeat shellers, uh, and it, and also within families. Um, but I know that it occurred more widely in the Western Gulf. Um, interestingly, right after, the seagrass die-off, which was also killed off a lot of the mollusk populations. So there were suddenly a lot mm -hmm. of empty gels. Um, so there was a real spike in the behavior after the seagrass die-off. And I think also the fish had less seagrass to hide in and they were like hiding in shells now. Um, wow. So it, it sort of spiked for a while. Um, so I can't really, it seemed like a lot more animals were doing it um, during a, a period of time after the seagrass die off. And then it sort of reverted back. Great. But we still don't I fully understand, you know, a lot about that behavior. Yeah. But it's been going on for decades. We started seeing, we've seen it since the early years of the study. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. And again, a fascinating talk. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave a little bit early, but um, mm -hmm. really, really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, just a reminder to folks on YouTube, we'd love to hear from you. So if you have questions, please post them and Karsten will um, ask the question for you. Uh, our next question goes to Eduardo. Thank you. I'm Eduardo Fernandez Duque here at University in the US. Thank you, Janet, for a very, very interesting talk. I, I am hoping you can share some more with us the specifics, the details of the natural history of the mating patterns. I understand, I am curious about the many limitations that there may be with the system as it is. So, so you shared the genetics of, I mean, the outcomes of, of mating patterns, but are you seeing the females mating with many males? Are the males competing, I mean, really, competing for access to the female. Well, what's going on behaviorally before we get those calves born? You talked about harassment. Yes. Uh, you, didn't okay. describe, um, you, didn't, you didn't describe the actual mating. Yeah, no. Um, well, there... Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. We uh, Most of the mating that we actually see is with, you know, the juveniles when it's not, uh, doesn't have reproductive consequences. Um, so seeing, uh, a mating between an adult male and adult female is actually quite rare. Mm -hmm. Um, the data we have, um, obviously they are mating. Um, so the, ma the males often will try to mount the female and she often goes belly up in the water, um, at the surface. And so the males, uh, can't for force her to mate, um, and if they do succeed in getting um, an intromission um, when she does that, it is not at a good angle. Um, the females have um, these vaginal folds and a pseudo cervix. And so if the males cannot mate with the female in the right position, then the like sperm literally goes off into some dead end chamber. Um, so in that way, the females can probably control the paternity. Um, and we have looked at de in detail at the paternities and um, find that the females are mating with local males, um, males that they know. And they are mate. And there is some suggestion that they might be able to um, choose, even though the males can kind of force a female to stay with them. Um, there's 
it looks like that they can still choose within that alliance on who's going to be the father uh, because um, the females, uh, we are detecting some preferential underlying relationship or prior association prior to when she was cycling and pri long prior to when she uh, could have be conceived that she has some relationship with that male, that, you know, that particular male. So we do think um, even in the face of this allied sexual coercion that females um, are finding some way to choose. Um, and that's work is in preparation. Um, yeah. So, so if I follow you with these crimes, make me think about some taxa where I understand the use of the word harassment, but it could also be that it's all part of some kind of behavioral interactions where the females are doing some kind of pre-mating choice process. I mean, the, 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 the description we're yeah. making of the female going belly up and, and, and her position, I mean, it could well be that all this, that there there's variation across females in the difficulty that they pose to the males, which in itself could be part of a process of the female actually making a choice, even when we perceive it ourselves yeah. to be harassment. I mean, I don't think so, because the females, you know, the males really work, you know, do to some degree work together, even though they're in competition to maintain, you know, get access to the females. So, um, and the females like always go, we rarely see them cooperate. The only time I've seen a female cooperate in mating with a male, she was like eight months pregnant. She's like, sure, go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> Um, but otherwise, um, they always go back up. Um, and the females do seem to try pretty desperately to escape from the males and the females, uh, sometimes assist. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to tell, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, they do get we, we've also documented the females have more injuries when they're cycling, um, you know, physical injuries, uh, presumably from the males, because females are virtually never aggressive. Um, and yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think they're like testing or seeing which male is like the best. I think they, they know these guys. I mean, they know them pretty well, uh, the males that they're with. And so I don't think they need to, um, they might know who's oldest and they seem to prefer the oldest male. Um, and they might, um, there's some other aspects, but I don't think they need to test them particularly. Thank you. All right. Our next question goes to Karsten. Okay, so it's already me, Carsten Schradin. I'm a researcher at the Senoris in Strasbourg, France, studying mammalian social evolution with small mammals in South Africa, where I'm at the moment. Thank you very much for really a fascinating talk. My question originally was about whether female mate choice plays an important role, but you just answered it. And of course, it does still play a role. But I think it's really fascinating to see this diversity of social systems, in this case here, fish and fusion systems with stable male bonds, female matrilines, this male harassment, very unique. So my question is, how unique is it within the cetaceans? Is this a very special species or does it something similar occur more often within the taxa of cetaceans? Um, yeah. Um... Another interesting question. Um, so at other sites for other like terciops, like in the same genus, they've uh, seen um, certainly male alliances. Um, the degree um, in other species, it doesn't seem like spotted dolphins. It seems like mating is more cooperative, although they also sometimes form alliances. Um, so uh, not a lot is known about about uh this you know it's certainly in the large whales um you know like right whales are famous for these kind of <clears throat> um aggressive mating groups where the males are all trying to mate with the female 
Um, and humpback whales, I don't think a mating has ever even been witnessed. <laughs> um, and so, uh, the, but the males compete pretty uh, all for themselves to try to get access to a single female. Um, so uh, I think the multi-level alliance formation has not, it, it's, it's been suggested at some other, other uh, sites for Terciops, but um, sort of is best documented in Shark Bay. Um, but basically, you know, for the smaller delphinids in particular that nurse their offspring for so long, um, you know, the operational sex ratio is highly, highly skewed. So, I mean, this is one thing I think that drives the cooperation between males because, um, you know, even though it reduces their chance of getting a paternity, um, they do do better than if they were um, on their own. And uh, there are some few cycling females at any given time. So the competition is very intense amongst the males to gain access to an individual female. Um, but I think the mating systems are not well known for most say, cetaceans, like down to like the sort of mating behavior. Um, so I, I wish I could answer the question, I mean, better than I have. You know, in sperm whales, it's just this, a big male goes into, you know, they're fairly solitary, the big sperm whale, like, and they're very sexually dimorphic, and they come into a group of females. Um, and presumably, it's a, a, a group of related females, presumably, um, you know, they only, like only one male can gain access to the one or two cycling females that might be in that group at a given time. So, yeah, I I wish I could better answer your question, but we just don't know know enough about it. Yeah, but it's already enough. I mean, it seems not to be so totally unique or common. I think that uh, with other mammalian taxa, some at least similar, if maybe not so extreme. Yeah, it's some. I mean, it generally, it um, the less dimorphic they are, uh, sexually dimorphic they are, um, then that's where you tend to see more alliances like at the moray firth of the terciops are really large they're four and a half meters and the males are much bigger than the females and their alliances have never been documented whereas in the smaller species you do tend to get male allies you know and possibly that's because one male can have better control if he's much bigger than the female Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm next in the queue, but I'm happy to defer to anyone who has additional questions. Eduardo, do you have another question you yeah, want to Yeah, I do, but go ahead if you want with yours. We have time. Okay. Well, uh, so I, I don't know where to start. I've got several questions. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, I guess I'll start with this one so you said that the if i remember correctly the spongers live longer the female spongers right mm -hmm. um and they're also the most solitary females mm -hmm. it, is it possible like do you see less harassment of those females and is it is do you think that if that's the case could that potentially explain their enhanced survival in the sense that there's fewer them it's less like the males find them or do the males actually because they're alone go after them more rig vigorously Uh, yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that question. It's a good question. Um, we do know that, like, the, um, I would say there's probably a bigger cost to the spongers um, when they're being consorted because they typically, it interrupts their sponging <laughs> and they, um, they are kind of forced out of an area usually that's not their, where their sponges are. Um, so, uh so my tendency would think that it's actually uh that the consortships might be more costly for them than for the other females who sometimes just go about their regular foraging activity um i think that the with the sponging i think that they're exploiting a niche that um is unavailable to the other um dolphins and that it might be much a reliable steady food source um but then you would expect them also to have better reproduction, which we haven't seen. 
either. So I guess I don't know. I mean, the other hypothesis, maybe there's like medical properties in the sponges that, because <laughs> there are actually like medicinal, like his, histamines and things in sponges, maybe, you know, they're better medicated <laughs> or something. Um, but yeah, I don't really know, but it does, it, it does speak to the issue of um, why, you know, just having friends isn't necessarily, or having lots of bonds is not necessarily always the end all be all. Um, you can be relatively solitary and have a nice long life if you wear a sponge. <laughs> cool. Um, and so my, my second question actually gets back to the, the extent of fission fusion and sort of the drivers of this. So it sounds like mm -hmm. What I remember, it sounds like they're on the high end of fusion fusion dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, do you know to the extent to which the male behavior drives those like maybe fusion events among females or am I missing something totally that this isn't happening? So um, it's affecting the fission fusion dynamics of females, I guess is the question. Yeah, I think it's more foraging because um, they tend to be solitary foragers although if they're, they're they're sometimes attracted to a big school of fish so that, you know then they'll, they'll forage socially but i think it's more um the foraging although females do um uh there is evidence that they aggregate you know when they're like when they're cycling um like with other females maybe for some protection um from males uh so but we haven't looked at that ex specifically we know like groups are larger when they have a, a, a very young calf so there's kind of anti-predation effects you know for grouping so they i think grouping is is driven primarily by the foraging ecology and also like the calf you know the females with calves are also more sociable so the, the calf can get some social experience. So those um, those are the things I think primarily, although I think there is probably some effect um, uh, of females sometimes um, grouping. We do see behavior changes when there's like males in the area, suddenly like females will kind of get very tight and start synchronizing together. Um, you know, and you like, oh, there must be males around. Like that's when you know to look. You suddenly see the females change their behavior and tighten up and synchronize, and then start looking around. And yep, oh, there's an, al an alliance of males kind of moving in. So the males sneak up on them too, though. So <laughs> thank you, mm -hmm. um, Eduardo. We have a new question come in, so I'm going to go to the to them first uh, to Francine. Oh. Thanks very much, um, and thank you for a wonderful talk. It's really fascinating. Um, I am a professor of comparative psychology, study primates in uh, University of Michigan, Dearborn, and I'm friends with Barb Smuts, so I'm actually going to mm -hmm. see her tomorrow, so I'll say that, that, that I saw your presentation, which has been fantastic, and, and thank you for all the questions and answers. Um, I was interested, mm -hmm. I had a number of questions. Um, you were talking about strong um, alliances with females, but really friendships between males. I don't know if that was just a way of describing it. I was curious about that distinction or if that really was a distinction or just that was the way that you were using the words. Um, another question I had was, you said when females are, are weaning their young, then the males will come to mate with them. What signals do the females present? that suggests that they're ready to mate. I didn't know if there's something that that shows. Um, and then, so two other points, sorry, I don't know if this is too much, but um, there's, they're all related. Um, when the females are old enough to mate, how do the males know that they're old enough? Do the females give signals? <clears throat> is there some sort of vocalization? Um, do the mothers try to protect their daughters? Um, are they still hanging out together? Um, and I suppose that has to do with, um, identifying individuals as well you know how do they make sure that they're not mating with their brothers or their uh, fathers so they clearly i you know identify individuals um i'm working with diana reese and brenda mccowan on um identifiers through vocalizations 
um, looking at uh, proper naming in bonobos compared to dolphins. And um, so I'm really interested in what vocalizations go along with what all these different social interactions that well, you can't describe it all, but you know, what what is the importance of vocalizations in the social interactions that you're describing? So those are a bunch of different questions. So feel free to not answer any of them or one of them, uh, whatever works best. Thanks so much. Okay, well, let me see if I can remember all those questions. <laughs> First, I might not remember all of them. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, like, how do they detect kind of estrus? I think was what you were asking in the in the females. Um, and we don't fully know the answer, but um, there could be two. One is like detecting chemical cues in the urine, but we think actually primarily that they use their echolocation their sonar is exquisite and they could most definitely detect changes um, during the ovulation, I think in the tissue of the females. So the males come in and um, actually use their sonar like right on the, on the females. Um, so with, speaking of which, because uh, when we look at their association, I had another student, um, Meg uh, Wallen, who looked at, um, male association and basically, you know, backtracking from when the calf was born, like when she would have got pregnant and the male seemed to be able to detect pregnancy like right away. So, uh, as well, like, uh, uh, so like to, you know, within days of conception. Um, so because they just kind of ignore the female after that. Um, <laughs> So they kind of drop them suddenly. So it suggests that the males, you know, really do know um, the reproductive state of the females. That said, they um, they do kind of harass them for months before, like kind of coming in and checking repeatedly um, on what her status is. And, and we think that some of that may be also to see how she'll react to them. <laughs> so sometimes they come in and kind of give her a hard time and then they leave. Um, uh, so, uh, there's quite a lot of that, um, mothers and their adult daughters are when, so, you know, the first time she's cycling, the males seem to know, um, know pretty well. Um, and we have no firstborn mortality effects. So females are as successful with their firstborn as, uh, you know, any other calf when they're young. Um, so they're not, but they're not like with their mother, you know, most of the time they might check in, but like they might spend only like 10% or 20% of their time, like uh, of their, so, you know, so time with anybody with their mother. So um, their mother really doesn't have much to do with it other than like they share the same network. Um, and uh, so we don't see like mother, daughter, really direct assistance. Um, they tend to hang out with other females, also their own age, other young females, um, which, you know, sometimes assist. Um, so, sorry, that was one. And then you want the coalition, well, I guess Friendship Coalition Alliance. I guess my understanding and somebody might have better definitions than me. I mean, I use Friendship to mean an affiliative relationship or preferential affili affiliative relationship as a friendship that um, is usually somewhat cooperative. Um, uh, I have coalition, is, I think of as a temporary um, cooperation, like opportun it could be opportunistic. Um, like in this particular context, somebody helps somebody else forms a coalition, temporary an alliance as um, a durable, like regular alliance, but also uh, that it is against a third party. So it is against a male or against a female, you know, or males or against a female. Uh, I guess a coalition is also usually um, against that, whereas um, a sort of friendship, I would say, is not necessarily targeted at a um, a third party um, uh, and is a little bit looser than the alliance. I mean, the alliance is based on um, cooperating against other parties. 
is I think the difference between that's the basis of it. Um, whereas the friendship is not necessarily, does that help the differentiation? And then the vocal, um, not really a bioacoustician, but I have done some work on their, both their signature whistles um, and their communication. And they do uh, at other sites, they've shown um, that they use their uh, signature whistles to uh, communicate, to announce themselves, you know, coming into a group and um, they use it to communicate a variety of things. Um, I don't think the, uh, we haven't, done recordings of cycling females to see i i doubt they would announce that they're cycling <laughs> i mean i just don't think i would be really surprised um uh certainly we see males find them and um you know we've recorded you know with um in that context there's aggressive vocalizations and screams but yeah um uh, I would be surprised if they announce it like in elephants, um, you know, or something like that. I hope that it, that covers most of them. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, the next question is for Eduardo. Yes, uh, Janet, you if I if I followed you, both the papers, the presentation. You were describing to us primarily a settled, settled population. What happens mm -hmm. outside? I mean, where do I find? And and you you made reference to six hundred square kilometers, which I imagine is broadly speaking the area where these six five hundred dolphins move around on an annual basis. Where do I find the next population of dolphins, and how does this one interact with other populations? Further out. I mean, I know that in one of the papers you talk that you have bisexual philopatry, but at some mm -hmm. level there has to be also bisexual dispersal. And where are they going? Mm. No. no, it's it's sort of it's like um an overlapping mosaic of home ranges. So uh, you know, one animal might have a very small home range, like 30 square kilometers, and another has 150 square kilometers. Um depending on usually what their foraging behavior is. So, but that over that, those home ranges like fully overlap with others. And so at the periphery of our, so the ones, you know, those 500, 600 animals are in our, like the smaller core area that we encounter, but there are lots of animals that we only see when we go to like the periphery of our range. So we're not getting, um, you know, for all of them that we don't that we don't cite that frequently, we're not getting their full networks because some of them are only getting one part of their home range um, when we see them. Um, so they're overlapping. Like so, there are dolphins. Like if we if we just kept driving the boat, we would see more new dolphins. If we okay. that and we might see dolphins we know as well, but that we see less frequently because we're only capturing. The southern part of their range and so on um so they all oh, they do all overlap but you know that said when we're looking for somebody that we you know of the the what i meant about those 500 to 600 animals we do know where to find them and we're probably capturing most of their home range but then there's uh, another like 300 animals that we only occasionally we see every couple of years um sometimes every three years you know and because we just don't go into the the main parts of their range very often. I hope that, yeah. I have a follow-up question. It's making me think uh -huh. of our scale, if it is okay. You were showing us the, the drone footage. Mm -hmm. uh, it was reminding me of my attempts. Well, I never did it very seriously. I need to give it another shot of flying the drones over the canopy to try to spot the owl monkeys. It seems like it's definitely mm -hmm. easier to spot the dolphins than the owl monkeys. So my question is, and, and a, I'm a firm believer in natural history, direct observation, so I, I suspect like you, so I'm not thinking, I don't want to see ourselves replaced by drones, but the, to the extent that it can add to what you do, ha, have you explored the possibility of having systematic surveys done with drones over the whole area, flying at various altitudes and collecting all kinds of data? 
Uh, yeah, we'd like to use the drones more because the animals don't seem bothered by them. Um, um, and that's largely because, like, their hearing is underwater, you know, and they would hear probably much of the drone above water. Um, the problem is that we identify them by their dorsal fins, and you have to be at uh, the sea level you know, you have to be on the water to photograph them. So you do still need a boat um, to be identifying the animal. So like in the drone footage, there was a boat there, but, you know, I know who all the individuals are from the drone, not because I can see their dorsal fins, but because of the person on the boat can, um, ah, you know, so. Okay. I was under the wrong impression. So you, right now you don't think you could identify individuals with the drone. No, not unless they um, have really distinctive damage or scars, okay. like a big shark bite or something. Mm -hmm. um, so we we could do. People use drone surveys to count the animals, but they don't. They can't. They wouldn't be able to follow individuals that way. Yeah. No, no, I was I was under the wrong impression of what you you could you could do. Thank you. I need to go. Yeah, thanks was, a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm going to email you, see if we can have another chance to chat some more. Okay, that'd be fun. Thank you, guys. Hi. Hey, yeah. Bye. All right, so I think at this point, uh, I'm going to stop the live stream. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but before I do, I want to thank you again, Janet, for a really fascinating talk, and that was a great great discussion, too. 